So the connection between broadband and housing policy is not only a natural fit, it's essential to building the economy of the 21st century. The question is how do we do this? You and I both know about the barriers that face low-income households from the cost of buying computers to the cost of monthly internet service, even if we assume that there is uh, the wiring to their buildings and their, to their units to get service. Uh, and, and Alberto talked eloquently about the way that this can be uh, what the expansion and creation of the internet, uh, interstate highway system was to the 20th century. But we also need, while we attack these barriers, we also need to focus on the barriers that stop folks from using that technology to their benefit. In other words, it is not just about the hardware, about the wiring, uh, about the, the computers themselves. It's also about the barriers to actually utilizing and benefiting from the technology. And we need to attack that fundamentally in three different ways. First of all, we need to make sure that we do local outreach that educates people on the specific ways that technology can improve their lives. Second, we need digital literacy training to get people comfortable with the technology and how to use it. And third, we need workforce development and financial literacy training so that they can get the most out of it to enhance opportunity in their lives. The federal government can't do this alone. We need to work in partnership with the nonprofit and private sectors. That's one of the fundamental recommendations of the National Broadband Plan to build partnerships that harness resources and commitments from nonprofits and private industry to bring down the cost of computers and monthly service, to provide free training and applications that help people access educational, employment, and other opportunities available through broad broadband, and to partner with other federal agencies like HUD that serve low-income people who lack these opportunities. Let me talk for a moment about why these partnerships are so important and so powerful. Uh, while I may look too young uh, for you to believe it, uh, I was at the 1977 World Series game in the South Bronx where Howard Co Cosell famously declared, ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning. And I saw firsthand what it meant for not only New York City, but the entire nation to be witnessing what we thought was the collapse and even the death of our central cities at that point. Uh, it, it was so desperate that we had neighborhoods surrounding uh, Yankee Stadium that literally lost 75% of their population in 10 years. While many people wrote off those neighborhoods, Beginning with a group called the Mid Bronx Desperados, a locally based nonprofit that literally shipped overnight in secret homes across the George Washington Bridge to start placing them in a, a neighborhood called Charlotte Gardens that was one of the most distressed that Jimmy Carter and then President Ronald, uh, candidate Ronald Reagan had visited to declare it like Dresden after World War II, uh, the hardest hit neighborhood in America. Groups like the Mid Bronx Desperados began house by house, block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, rebuilding that community. And if you go back to the new Yankee Stadium today, what you see is a thriving neighborhood, still one of the poorest communities in America, but a community that's been rebuilt with access to opportunity, to decent schools. All of it started not by some grand federal government program, not started uh, by uh, even local government, which became a, a strong partner, but driven largely by the emergence of locally based community development corporations that started a revolution in housing to the point where today our most creative housing developers and in some cases our most important civic institutions in low income neighborhoods are not government institutions, not for profit institutions, but nonprofit CDCs. We need, if we are going to be successful in creating access and opportunity uh, in those lowest income communities, we need to engage those private sector partners, the for profits, but also fundamentally engage that third sector of nonprofits who can be our partners 
uh, and help us find the best ways to open the doors to opportunity in those communities. So whether it's in the South Bronx and other central cities or in rural America, we need to engage these partners like never before. By bringing broadband into the homes of every American, including in federally assisted housing, we can not only give hope to millions of households, we can create a geography of opportunity where our choices are never limited or our futures determined by the zip code that we grow up in. That's what this effort is about, and that's why I'm proud to be working with Julius and so many other partners to take on these challenges with our nonprofit and private partners in the months to come and to be successful in the years before us to remake opportunity across this country. Thank you so much for being here today. I look forward to our partnership. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to share my story with you. My name is Rhonda Locklear. I'm from Pembroke, and I'm a member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina. I have two children, and like any mother, I want the best for my boys. Jacob, my oldest, is a transferring student to UNC Pembroke, and Isaac is in the eighth grade at Pembroke Middle School. Like most families, have access to high-speed internet who, or who can't afford it, we were stuck with dial-up service in our home until two months I feel that this has put my family, my sons in particular, at a severe disadvantage. Isaac depends on the internet to complete his assignments for school, internet to work on reports, projects, or often at times to just do research because he could not move around on the web like he likes and needed to do. Seemingly easy assignments took him hours to complete. It's very disheartening to watch. Isaac got very upset, discouraged, and frustrated because he could not do what he needed to do. As a mother, it breaks my heart, him, in some way. In Robinson County, where I live, the economic situation is dire for our community and for the Lumbee tribe. The textile industry has disappeared and so have the jobs. And without high-speed internet, we don't stand a chance of reviving our economy. And without high-speed internet, my son's chances of a better future are at risk. The world has become so dependent on technology and the internet that if our children don't get what they need, they're going to be left behind. I envision a future for myself, my boys, and the Lumbee community can fully participate in the 21st century through, through, light, through the internet. It is my hope that the net can alleviate these struggles and give my community and communities across the country access to fast, affordable, open internet. Our future as a tribe and depends on it. Thank you for coming together today. to talk about the digital. Thank you very much, Rhonda. I'd like